I find it very frustrating uh, that Beijing uh, said that this election is a choice between peace and war. And that's a line that's being adopted by the KMT during the campaign. And I also see uh, international media picks up this uh, framing in their reporting of this election. And I just find it very troubling. Um, this is definitely not a choice between peace and war. All three candidates campaign on maintaining the status quo and maintaining peace across the strait. And uh, by, so by uh, electing Lai, the Taiwanese people did not choose to go to war with China. Welcome to this post-Taiwan election conversation hosted by the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. I'm Maggie Lewis, Associate Dean and Professor of Law at Seton Hall University. And like the other people here with me this evening, I am here in Taiwan. I'm joined by two friends who I expect are equally sleep deprived as I am. Yu Jia Chen, who is an assistant research fellow at Academia Sinica's Law Institute. She's also a non-resident affiliated scholar at NYU Law School's US Asia Law Institute. Also, Brian Hyo, who's a non-resident fellow of the Taiwan Research Hub at the University of Nottingham. Welcome to you both. So, Thank Brian, you. I'm going to start with you and dig right in because we want to have a lot to cover in a short time. So, Lai Qingde, the Democratic Progressive Party or DPP candidate, received about 40% of the votes, with the Guomindang or KMT candidate, Hou Youyi, receiving 33%. And the third party candidate, Ke Wenzhe, of the Taiwan People's Party, or TPP, receiving about 26% of the votes. So first, who are these quarter of voters who went out and voted for the third party candidate? And just more generally, how does Lai win the confidence of 60% of the electorate who did not vote for him? Yeah, so it is quite interesting because I think many have struggled to understand the co phenomenon. Uh, he rose out of seeing nowhere. And despite being a third party candidate and running for president on that basis, he has mounted a uh, quite sizable challenge to the established two party dominance of the DPP and the KMT. Uh, in particular, there's a lot of focus on that many of his supporters seem to be young people that maybe resonate with you know, his personality or his political message. And that is in itself maybe up for debate. Because uh, there's been a lot of discussion, for example, of Ko as a candidate that is appealing to young people on the basis of this focus that's not just on cross relations, on economic issues, that young people face low salaries, unaffordable housing, there are these demographic issues facing Taiwan, growing declining birth rate and rising elderly population. Uh, then that's actually something that all the parties have discussed in election campaigning. And the other paradox thing that people have tried to understand is that he has made misogynist uh, statements many times, and Taiwan just saw a wave of Me Too cases. Some statements of his have been interpreted as homophobic, uh, despite that Taiwan legalized gay marriage and young people support that. And when one goes to the co-rallies then, uh, the rallies for the TPP, they are in fact full of young people. And perhaps that is who is voting for him. Is there, there's a question then, is Gen Z supportive of Co because they are dissatisfied with the DPP and the status quo that it represents? Because particularly for them, the DPP is in power for quite a long time. And now we enter a unprecedented third consecutive DPP uh, presidential term. And uh, it seems like the DPP is losing ground and perhaps some people, young people are going to co in that sense. Yeah, I and agree. As, you know, not just young people, but young men seem to be disproportionately. So yes, I don't know, you, Joe, if you want to add anything about, about the co phenomenon. Yeah, I went to the rally uh, just uh, on the eve of the election and uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, there were so many people uh, and uh, yes, a lot of them were in their 30s, 40s or even 50s. So you can call that younger generation um, uh, supporting Ke and, you know, Ke's DPP was just established in uh, 2019. So it's only a four year old party. So it's quite impressive that um, they would be able to pull out these uh, voters. And I think um, 
you know, I think Ke definitely will play a decisive role later in the legislative yuan. I, I know we're going to talk about that um, later, uh, but I want to emphasize that um, Lai was not looking too happy uh, last night uh, during his victory speech and the international uh, press briefing. And I think he recognized the immense challenge that he is going to face uh, as a president who doesn't have majority in the legislature. Um, but I think given that, um, you know, the ruling party always has a disadvantage whenever um, it, it has ruled for eight years, people are naturally dissatisfied with their performance and they're going to cast their vote. Um, to um, make to register that critique. So, given that um, uh, premise, I think Lai uh, is already uh, doing as well as he possibly could. No, I I mean I think about it that first time voters, so twenty year olds. You know, there's about a million of them that were eligible to vote in this election. And they were twelve when Sai took office. That's about my son's <laughs> age. So they really have grown up with one with one party. Um, and certainly we're all looking to see what happens with Ke because he doesn't have an official role, but he is so dominant in his party. You know, even the lapel pins I noticed when we were meeting with them were KP for Ke P, <laughs> his nickname, not TPP. So it, it does seem to be uh, very much focused on, on, on him. So I'm going to, um, you know, thinking too a little bit about how we are trying to see this from inside Taiwan, but also outside Taiwan, uh, that all of us I know have been following closely the international media. And and so maybe to you, Jia, that a prevalent framing is that lies victory will be a market worsening in cross-strait relations or to limit, um, you know, at least he's not going to have what people are saying, maybe Ho or Ke would have received a honeymoon period, and instead there's going to be a ratcheting up in, in tensions. I mean, to what extent do you think that narrative accurately captures what's happening or could happen soon? So, so first of all, Lai has been campaigning on uh, maintaining the status quo. So uh, he keeps saying that he will continue uh, Tsai Ing-wen's uh, foreign policy as well as China policy. And that's a policy that uh, international community generally recognize as a balanced and moderate policy. And so he, it's clear that he doesn't want to rock the, the boat with China. Uh, but of course, he's going to continue uh, the DPP stance favoring uh, for Taiwan, favoring Taiwan's autonomy. Um, in terms of Beijing's reaction um, yesterday, right after uh, the the uh, result have come out, uh, the Guo Taiban, the uh, Taiwan's. Of it, uh, the Taiwan office um, has already come out and uh, said that. Um, the DPP doesn't represent the mainstream uh, public mm -hmm. opinion on the island, and they're right because uh, Lai only secure forty percent of the vote. Um, but also, they said that uh, you know, sort of uh, repeated the line uh, of Xi Jinping saying that uh, it's inevitable that the motherland will eventually uh, unify. So, uh, so far, that's a uh, that that's not something. Uh, that's surprising. Uh, it's pretty anticipated that they will come out with this kind of statement. Uh, for the future, I think uh, Beijing will definitely ramp up the uh, pressure uh, economically, politically, uh, diplomatically, and militarily uh, on Lai's future uh, government. And even before uh, Lai's inauguration, on May 20th, we will see an escalation of Beijing's coercion. And that's because uh, Beijing, after experiencing two DPP presidents, that is Chen Shui-bian and Tsai Ing-wen, Beijing kind of uh, has a good idea of, at least from their perspective, they have a good idea of what they're dealing with. And therefore, they don't think Lai Qingde will um, be someone uh, who will not advocate for Taiwan independence. Uh, and that's something that's 
really a deal breaker for them. So there's really no room for negotiation with Beijing. Uh, from Beijing's perspective, Lai has been labeled as a troublemaker, and they're not going to change their mind on him. So I will only anticipate an escalation of uh, Beijing's pressure on Taipei. Yeah, Brian, I'd love your thoughts on this too, especially given that we've got over four months until the inauguration. You know, on the one hand, this could create instability, but on the other hand, it's DPP to DPP and Lai is the current vice president. So perhaps that lengthy time will not be significant. What do you think? Um, yeah, so the ball is really in Beijing's court, how to react, and they may react, have they uh, done similarly in the past, for example, with military exercises, uh, also possible economic measures like coercion, announcing new bans or ends to tariffs, or publicizing their ending ECFA, for example. And so it is a question now. I think there will be some kind of reaction from Beijing to show its strength to flex its muscles. But then how far they want to take it also really depends on the present political moment in terms of the relation with the U.S., uh, do they want to unruly push more people to side with the DPP and so forth? I think what's quite interesting about the statement from the Taiwan's Affairs Office is the line about working with the political forces in Taiwan that are closer to its position. And one wonders then if there'll be attempts to circumvent the DPP government and go directly to pan blue political parties. I think it's also interesting to think uh, through then what Beijing will consider its relation with the TPP. And I think that's kind of been unclear. I mean, there was all this debate and questioning as to which candidate that China preferred in a race, which one saw perhaps up to even three pan blue candidates, whether Terry Go, Hoi or Ko Wenzhou, who it would prefer. And then at a certain point, Go dropped out. Uh, China seemed to signal displeasure through searching Foxconn offices on tax evasion charges and similar charges. Uh, there's also a wave of online disinformation targeting not just Lai, but also Co, which seemed to signal that then Beijing preferred the KMT. But then would Beijing change horses at this juncture? In the meantime, Lai, I think, is expected to keep his head down because he has tried to pick himself as keeping the same policy as Tsai and trying to be colorless in some way. Because I think too often in the past, the reporting on him has been framing him as a kind of very ideologically driven, a uh, pro-independence politician, which is the perception that Beijing would like to see internationally as well as a way to marginalize support for the DPP. And so I think Lai will really stick to this, particularly in the start of his term. It'll be seen if that changes as time goes on, and maybe he feels more confident to take on other positions. But in the meantime, it's clear that this will be the dynamic, I think. I think in Lai's first term, uh, he's not uh, likely uh, to upset the relations with the U.S. Uh, because he's definitely running for the second term and the second term uh, campaign will require the U.S. support as well as the support of the public opinion. So in his first term, I'm likely, I think we're likely to see a more uh, restrained light administration taking into account how the U.S. feels about cross-strait relations. Um, the unknown factor, in fact, is the November election in the United States. <laughs> and I think that will, that, that will really, uh, you know, that depend, you, you know, I think, uh, Lai will ha have to see, you know, who is he is going to work with uh, to keep uh, steady cross strait relations. Yes, and so you know, with the with the cross strait relations. You know, one thing with the, the TPP, Ko Wenzhou's party, who also we often say Ko because we're flipping between the Mandarin and, and, and Taiwanese. <laughs> but I, he, he's been exceedingly difficult to pin down when it comes to articulating policy. I mean, we just kept being told by the TPP that they believe in being scientific and rational and pragmatic, uh, but I'll, I'll, there's not a lot of shape to what that is. So we'll, we'll wait and see. And then on the on the KMT side, you know, one thing that has struck me is that when we speak in terms of the pan blue, meaning the, the generally in the KMT grouping and the more generally pro uh, engagement or conversation and or even closer ties with China, that I've noticed that there's a lot of texture uh, with you have the views, for example, expressed by former President Ma Ying-jeou, quite different than what we were hearing from the Hoyo we campaign. And in fact, you know, Ho went out of his way to uh, to be very clear that he is a different sort of KMT than mine, Joe, uh, late in the campaign, uh, when there was uh, an interview that really brought out some of that tension. So before we turn to the US Taiwan dynamics, um, you know, any, any thoughts about the future of the pan blue of the KMT as, as they sort of regroup after after the significant loss for the presidency? 
there are many different, uh, um, there are a diverse uh, voices from the KMT camp. That's true. And some of them are uh, uh, in a way closer uh, to the DPP's position in terms of wanting to form uh, closer ties with the US, Japan, and other democracies, that's for sure. But uh, I think overall speaking, uh, the KMT and the Pan Blue camp uh, is still um, under their framework of the 1992 consensus when it comes to negotiating with China. And the 1992 uh, 1992 consensus is at best uh, a, a strategic fiction that's used to uh, sort of agree to disagree with Beijing in terms of Taiwan sovereign status. Um, and so that kind of vague position, I feel, uh, is already fading out of the scene uh, based on this election result. Uh, the 1992 consensus uh, is not a winning strategy. Um, and I talked about how um, the ruling DPP would have a disadvantage going into this election. But in the end, uh, the DPP still secured the victory, meaning that the voters still support the kind of China policy to some extent that the DPP has maintained. And the KMT's 1992 consensus is not able to garner uh, enough votes for them to win the presidential election. So I think it's definitely a warning sign that uh, this framework needs to be replaced if the KMT wants to win future national elections. Yeah, I mean, jumping off that point, it's quite interesting that, that successive KMT chairs, such as Johnny Chang and Eric Chu, have proposed moving away from the Italian consensus and face opposition in their own parties, which then made them stick to it. Uh, Hoyui himself, initially in the first stages of campaigning, was very reluctant to express outright support for the 1990 consensus, also realizing this perhaps a toxic brand. In the beginning, he said that he respected former President Ma ying -jo's position on the 1990 consensus, and then later on switched to more explicit support. And so with, for example, Ma's comments, and then Ho seeking to distance himself from that, quickly trying to uh, push Ma away, not, not being invited to the final rallies of the KMT, Perhaps it, it was an opportunity for him to distinguish himself politically, but it just occurred too late in the election cycle to really influence the outcome. And so it is a question, I think, going forward. I don't think new ideas are exactly coming out of the KMT right now or the Pan Blue Camp as a whole. And I think particularly for the TPP, it also has to be cautious regarding how to distinguish itself from the KMT, because if it just becomes a little blue party, a small third party that basically has the same positions as the KMT, it's not going to survive for a long time, and uh, particularly its relation to Co. So I think I think there's a lot of uncertainty for the Pan Blue Camp going forward. Uh, if there had been a situation in which there was a more outright defeat, the KMT leadership would have had to resign. And perhaps there's still be pressure on the chair to resign, depending on what occurs in the coming days and how it's framed. But if so, there'd be a power vacuum in the party. And that could have also led to different political forces taking the lead within the KMT. I am sure it is not going to be dull as this goes forward. So I'm, I'm, I think we're all curious to see what happens with those party dynamics. But uh, shifting our lens to U.S.-Taiwan relations, uh, we had Secretary of State Blinken stated when congratulating Lai that, quote, the United States is committed to maintaining prostrate peace and stability, and the peaceful resolution of differences free from coercion and pressure. You know, that sounds Great, and the U.S. has been hugely supportive of of Taiwan, and in fact, you know, the the representative that's been who has been based in D.C. Uh, is now the incoming vice president, uh, Xiaobi Kim. Uh, nonetheless, the conversation here in Taiwan is this email lun, this idea of skepticism about the U.S. You know, does it really have Taiwan's back? If there was an escalation that spilled over into a cross strait conflict, you know, would the U.S. actually intervene and with the full uh, protective forces that it could offer? So I don't know if either of you have thoughts about how prominent that could have been in voters' minds and, and sort of what maybe Lai needs to do or the U.S. needs to do to uh, address that skepticism. The interesting thing to me, I think, particularly, is it's becoming increasingly deeply set in the Pan Blue Camp, this kind of U.S. skepticism, uh, along with global events such as the war in Ukraine and so forth. But I think it also reflects a larger structural shift on the part of the KMT, in which a party that was once opposed to China is now the China-friendly party. 
correspondingly, the former ally of the U.S. that backed the KMT uh, in the Cold War is now then demonized in some respect. And so I think that's something I see among the KMT grassroots with increasingly vocal fighting blues that are very hardline on such issues, calling into a question U.S. arms purchases. And so if that is what the grassroots is thinking and feeling at the moment, that can be quite dangerous in a legislature that uh, in which there are more pan blue legislators than pan green ones. They might try to block arms purchases or throw them into question. And it might be quite unpredictable. It's very hard to know what will happen going forward. But I do think that the U.S. skeptic discourse is here to stay and uh, global events such as the election will be framed in terms of amplifying that. Well, seeing that there's so much uncertainty depending on the results of the U.S. election, that just goes to show then how the U.S. Uh, is not reliable and this relation is questionable. That's the rhetoric I think will come out of the Pan Blue camp. So um, I think the uh, election result is uh, in, an indication that this email ruin skeptic skepticism of the U.S. Uh, potential intervention in cross-strait conflict is dying down uh, because uh, you can see that all of the three uh, political parties uh, favor maintaining uh, close ties with the U.S. They differ uh, in terms of their approach uh, to China and how to maintain the status quo with China. But I think they all campaign on having a good relationship with the U.S. Uh, and therefore, uh, we don't see uh, uh, that kind of uh, narrative of Yi Mei Lun uh, during the campaign as much as we saw uh, earlier last year. And also the election result, uh, uh, voting for Lai and also voting for Ke, who uh, sort of said that he will continue, if he wins, he would continue Thai's foreign policy as is. So I think that's uh, with their votes combined, that's, uh, that's a representation of a strong support for stronger U.S.-Taiwan relations. So um, I'm glad that this, tone, um, I'm glad that this kind of narrative has toned down, um, but uh, Brian is right that in the future, we don't know whether it will be revived again, especially given uh, China's misinformation campaign to promote this kind of narrative. Right. And and so we're seeing that not only, though, has uh, Blinken had the, the statement, but we've already received word that there's going to be an unofficial delegation because they're always unofficial uh, from the U.S., uh, oftentimes including uh, some previous government officials as well as Laura Rosenberger, who is key in the U.S.'s team dealing with Taiwan uh, affairs. So we definitely have this sense of repeddling the bicycle. Things are continuing. The U.S.-Taiwan relations are strong. But I agree that November is, of course, going to be a huge test, uh, especially given that uh, the counterpart in the U.S. is that there's this growing sense that the isolationist and, and pulling back from having a very robust role in the world is something that's not not a small percentage of American support. So maybe we'll have to we'll, re, we'll reconvene this maybe when we throw in uh, the U.S. election results down the road. Uh, so I also wanted to make sure in the time that we have left that we covered that yesterday was not just about the presidency that gets most, I think, of the attention outside Taiwan, but it was also that the full legislature uh, was elected. So every four years, the, the unicameral legislature is elected, and it has seats that are the majority of which are based on legislative districts, people going back home and voting for someone to represent where they live, but also having the party list where people vote for a party. So there are people in the legislature that are not geographically tied, as well as a few seats that are allocated based on in indigenous peoples. Uh, no party has a majority. Um, this is an interesting uh, position we're in. And, and so maybe starting with Brian, what does this mean for Lai and his prospects of passing legislation? And especially with Ko's party, the TPP, holding what could be a powerful majority forming eight seats? Uh, how, how might this play out? Yeah, so I think it's a good question. And so we can perhaps look back to some historical precedents, such as the Chen administration, in which the DPP also did not control the legislature. Uh, and so it is true that I think legislative races still perhaps do favor the KMT in many circumstances, in which uh, then it was only between 2016 and 2024 then that a non-KMT party has held the majority in the legislature in Taiwan's history. 
Um, it really does depend, I think, on where the pan blue camp is at in terms of sentiment. Will they engage in scorched earth tactics and try to block everything? Uh, it's it's a question, actually. And so I, I do wonder. There are things that can be done just through the presidency. And so I also do think the DPP would not go unaware into the circumstances without expecting this to be the outcome. And so I think there were plans in terms of what to do or what strategies to take, but will that be effective? As for Co and the TPP, it was expected that it might hold the position of perhaps counterbalancing between the two parties. And so when pressured by the KMT to commit more firmly towards aligning with it, the TPP has also kept open the possibility of working with pan-green politicians, even as during the presidential and vice presidential debates, they mostly talk about outreach to each other. And so I think also the TPP really needs to clarify its stances and it will be put in a position because it does need to distinguish itself from the KMT. Otherwise, it runs the risk of becoming indistinguishable from it. And yet its base is still more pan blue seemingly at present. Yeah, so so Ke already said yesterday that uh, he will uh, be willing to work with other political parties issue by issue. And so I think it will be crunch time for negotiations in terms of how to form this coalition. Uh, uh, the TPP will become a desired commodity in the eyes of the KMT and the DPP. So both parties will try very hard to uh, persuade Ko to uh, cooperate with them. And the, D the DPP uh, as the ruling party has some cabinet positions to offer to the TPP. So it will be interesting to see how this negotiation turns out. I think it's really important uh, for, for example, the defense budget. Um, there's still a huge chunk of uh, policy that will require legislative approval, such as defense budget. So if the DPP wants to carry out uh, its own defense policy, increasing the de defense budget, uh, et cetera, it will require uh, the cooperation of the TPP. And, and TPP has already said, uh, Ke, Ke already came, during the campaign said that um, his policy, foreign policy, is in line with Taiwan's foreign policy. So given that shared uh, goal, I think uh, the DPP may find it easier um, to work with the TPP on that point. I'll say it, it's hard enough when a president in Taiwan has a legislature that's from the same party. It's not that that has been smooth sailing for Thai, so this is just adding another layer. Um, and hopefully we won't go back to the Chen Shui Bian time where the KMT legislature was was really difficult to work with. Hopefully we're in a new a new time uh, where there can be more consensus. But again, this is gonna this is gonna take time to figure out. And and because we have two lawyers on this call. I also have to say that you know there's more than two branches of government in Taiwan. Um, there's the examination and the control UN, but there's also the judiciary, and and certainly it's come into play. For example, when same-sex marriage uh, was legalized, like that that originated with with the courts, and it pushed the legislature into action when there wasn't necessarily a lot of momentum. So I don't know if there's anything that we see on the on the horizon, Yujia, that, that might have the uh, the court involved in this too, or is that something which is kind of an unknown quantity right now? One of the, uh, one of the uh, issues that was sort of, I think, manipulated, uh, manipulated uh, at, toward the end of the campaign was death penalty. And I expect that uh, there will be continue, there will continue to be a discussion of death penalty, not only um, among the public, but also in, in the court very likely. And if the court takes this case, uh, it may uh, be, um, it, I, I think it will stimulate uh, a lot of controversy. Um, I do think the death penalty is a more divided issue even more so than the same-sex marriage issue. But it's been something that has been talked about during every election and has been an issue that's been used to attack uh, the ruling party, the ruling DPP that uh, uh, doesn't want to uh, execute any death row prisoners. So that's something to watch. Brian, any thoughts on that? I know the death penalty has generally received very strong support uh, by the population. And this has been a point when Taiwan has its self-imposed human rights reviews uh, that international observers have uh, pushed 
I wanted to reconsider both having the death penalty at all, as well as the way it is used, including uh, the lack of notification uh, that goes into it of, of, of the families and, and the prisoners. So the, both the process and, and the actual use of executions. Yeah, absolutely. And so this is something uh, that the KMT knows is the weak point of the DPP. And so, for example, when uh, during the presidential debates, Lai was called on to answer about this. He even answered, but did not emphasize opposition to the death penalty, even though that maybe was stance or at least not carrying it out. And then Hoyui afterwards, many times would bring this up publicly and try to call on Lai to clarify his stance. And then violent incidents, particularly, are seized on for electioneering in this this frame, saying that there needs a need for the death penalty to be social deterrence against violent crimes. Uh, this kind of drawing on, particularly, I think, for Ho in his campaign, he really benefited from being a former police officer and then appealing to this kind of law and order rhetoric uh, that society is getting dangerous because of the DPP's ineptness in government and unwillingness to carry out the death penalty as social deterrence for violent crimes. And I expect this to come up again as an issue. And uh, I think the the Taiwan. Even as you do have, for example, the legalization of gay marriage and a lot of progressive conferences, the discourse on the death penalty is very different. And the public is at a completely different place, I think, uh, than much of the world. And so I think this is uh, still an unresolved kind of uh, issue, and it will become contentious in the future as well. Something else to watch. So as we sort of move towards wrapping up, I, I wonder if you could both maybe uh, tell me an issue or a perspective that you either wish would get amplified outside of Taiwan, get some more attention in the international media, or is there something in the international conversation already that, about Taiwan that, that frustrates you or makes you do a little eye roll emoji? <laughs> I'll do the eye roll emoji first. I find it very frustrating uh, that Beijing uh, said that this election is a choice between peace and war. And that's a line that's being adopted by the KMT during the campaign. And I also see uh, international media picks up this uh, framing in their reporting of this election. And I just find it very troubling. Um, this is definitely not a choice between peace and war. All three candidates campaign on um, maintaining the status quo and maintaining peace across the strait. And uh, by so by uh, electing Lai, the Taiwanese people did not choose to go to war with China. And so I just want to clarify this and say that um, it, Lai's uh, selection is really a result that uh, Taiwanese people want to uh, maintain the peace. Uh, while also reaching out to other democracies uh, to keep Taiwan safe. And by framing the election as a choice between uh, peace and war, I think uh, plays to the fear uh, during campaigns, and that's not a healthy sign of a democracy. Uh, and also, um, I think it implicitly undermines and discourages Taiwan's uh, democratic pursuit, being able to make its own choices and not constrained by this kind of threat. Yeah, I mean, as for me, I think particularly what's interesting is that many of the domestic issues in Taiwan, some are just completely sidelined during elections, because if you're uh, you're pushing for something or advocating something, you don't know what the next government will be. And so you're kind of waiting and seeing. And there's also the possibility that when you do push for an issue, it gets amplified in a way that perhaps results in backlash. Uh, so for example, <clears throat> sorry again, the Italian administration has gotten much accolades for the legalization of gay marriage. But then there are aspects that were still being worked on uh, and took some time to fix, such as the lack of allowing for transnational gay marriages or adoption rights. Uh, but I think particularly trans rights in Taiwan is a we're at a very interesting juncture. And so there should be hopefully action on them in the future. But I think it's not particularly salient or as discussed during this election cycle. And so I think that's one of the issues that I think that I would hope there would be more coverage of. And in the meantime, on many of the social issues, at least publicly, the parties seem to agree that there are all these issues regarding the poor economy, uh, or at least that economic growth has not trickled down to the regular person. And yet they have different proposals and somehow these issues are not getting fixed. And so I think just the domestic uh, dynamic of Taiwanese politics is still, I think, covered up very much by the prostrate issues. And there are things that Taiwan is known for now internationally, again, like you guys in gay marriage, but there are aspects of LGBTQ advocacy that are not as widely discussed, I think, internationally in terms of the conversation around Taiwan. And I will say, having come for this election after just being in Beijing, I am just always thrilled that these conversations are being had and civil society is so active here. And um, and we could go on for, for ages, but we do want to um, 
wrap this up. So I want to thank you, Jan Bryan, and I want to encourage everyone listening to read their writing. Uh, Bryan produces an extraordinary, extraordinary amount of excellent content for New Bloom ma Magazine online, as well as other venues. Uh, UJ, like me, tends to write with more footnotes, but very readable articles about legal issues and how they play in as well as reaching out into uh, more online publications. So do look for them. And I want to thank the National Committee for hosting and convening this conversation. And I look forward to doing this again in four years in January 2028.